Hey, Kermit Weeks here, Fantasy of Flight, and uh, I'm thinking I'm going to go do a Kermit cam in the Feastler storage here. What do you think? Anyway, so uh, I got it in the hanger here. I'm going to go ahead and put my uh, put my deal on, and uh, I think that's probably adjusted okay. First thing I'm going to do is I still got the chalks in, so I'll go ahead and I want to pull through the uh, pull through the engine before we start it. The fuel is off. The mags are off and the throttle is back. Want to make sure the engine doesn't start. We got the chalks in. Uh, you know, anytime we have any uh, airplanes that we start that have cylinders pointing down, this is an inverted V8. So you can see the cylinders basically, uh, you know, inside there. And they're all pointing down. And uh, after you shut the engine down from flying it previously, the oil will slowly gravitate down and you want to make sure you don't get a a hydraulic lock if the oil fills up in the bottom of the cylinder. Piston comes down. If there's not enough space, uh, then you can actually bend one of the connecting rods. So anyway, so what we're going to do here is we're going to pull through the engine at least uh, six revolutions. That's two, three, four, five, Six, okay, that's all good. We can get rid of the chocks, don't need those anymore. And uh, one of the things I can do is I can actually kind of fly this thing, get it in and out of the hangar myself. Get rid of that rudder lock. We usually stow that back here. And uh, also get rid of the elevator lock, which is under there. Do you see that right there? Pull the stick back a little bit. Disconnect that. Clips right there. Anyway, so now the controls are free. And uh, I can just push it out myself. Got my little bar. Sometimes I gotta get it rocking. And sometimes I'm not strong enough. Got it. Is the wing clear? Looks clear. Once it gets out the hangar, I got it. Good. All right, there we go. Alrighty, it's pretty good. Got a nice little tow bar. Stop and Z. Okay, it just clips out right there. Clips out on the other side. Now we're done with the tow bar. Lay that there for now. Isn't she a beauty? I love this airplane. This is such a great airplane. Okay. Double check that the, uh, double check that the, uh, you know, the fuel's off. Okay, so do pre-flight. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check to make sure we got fuel and oil uh, coming up. You can stand on the tire down here, stand on the deal here, stand on the strut, there's a stand here, there's a step right here, and we check the right tank, okay, it looks like there's a little less than half in there. There's also a fuel sight gauge. It's like a little cork system that we'll also check. Okay, I should be able to kind of walk over to the other side here. Put my step right there. I'll visually check it. Yeah, this one's got a little bit more. That one's about two-thirds or half maybe 
it holds about 20 gallons per side so it's about 40 gallons total burns about 15 gallons an hour uh, cruising make sure I don't bust my butt so you can divide that into 40 and figure out how much uh, time you got I want to be on the ground about two hours so like it's got plenty of oil in there it's got a dipstick but if you take it off you can see it as well and of course it's probably the airplane's been sitting for a while so it's probably going to smoke a lot when i start it and uh <coughs> the uh, uh the oil that's sitting in the engine will get collected and it'll go back up and the oil level will actually go up a little bit this is actually a hand crank start in case the battery's dead you can actually there's a thing in the cockpit and you can actually crank it like this and it'll turn it through and uh, you can start the air, uh, engine manually uh, just kind of double check everything all the looks good in there this is the uh, stacks this is the oil cooler uh, right here um, I just looking at everything for uh, any problems um, the, the the Germans actually they had two different types of uh, cylinders that they used and in this particular one we're in a pretty hot climate and uh, because of the fact uh, you can look back in the North African desert where Rommel used to fly this these things or fly in them anyway and and they all have the cowlings off on the side um, when I picked this airplane up at the uh, EA Museum in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, it had the cowlings on it, and by my first stop, I pulled them off, I found some bubble wrap, I threw them in the back of the airplane, and I flew it home this way, and we just pretty much fly it with the cowling off all the time. We've got the cowling, and if you were flying it in the, uh, you know, the, on the eastern front, it wouldn't be a problem, but here in Florida, on the western front, we uh, basically leave them off. Um, okay, uh, just, you know, checking the landing gear. This has got really long uh, oleos and, uh, you know, they're uh, hydraulic, you know, so it's got a, like a metering valve that's tapered that goes into a hole. And when you take off, the landing gear legs actually drop down about, uh, got a foot and a half or something. So they're designed to come in at a, a really high angle if you need to, to make a short landing because this is a stole airplane a short takeoff and landing and uh, does a freaking great job it's a really really good airplane so because the landing gear legs are really long when it's flying uh had big long legs the german thought it, germans thought it looked like a stork so they call it a stork a stork storch uh that's uh, what they call it um one of the things that's really cool on this airplane is the fact that the germans were absolutely ingenious they the wings actually fold on this airplane okay and uh, if you look at the little red T handle up there, right here, it's got a little safety wire on it. If you cut that safety wire and, uh, you know, pull this handle out, you got a couple of guys working on it with a, like a ladder out there on the wingtip. But basically these little things here move up and you can see where the wing hinges right there. And uh, it basically, uh, you know, it's got like a, a, a little bit of a ball in there as well. And, uh, and what happens is you pull that pin on uh, in the front, which actually holds the front spar. And, uh, you know, the ailerons are all connected and everything on swivels and stuff. And the wing swings back. And if you look up here, you can see the... This little thing back here, the wing swings back here, it rotates sideways up against the side here, and this little bracket right here, and there's one on the other side, hooks up to that deal there, and you can actually store the airplane inside. So it's a very, very practical airplane. <laughs> so we're just checking for, you know, the pins are in. Here's the fuel gauge, like I said, and remember this, this tank had more fuel in it. There's actually a cork that floats inside the uh, the fuel tank so uh, this confirms what I saw which is about two-thirds fuel um, checking the slot up there I'll explain that in a little bit just kind of look and make sure there's no dings or anything 
Here's the ailerons, checking for cotter pins. There's a balance weight right here for uh, aileron flutter. Germans figured out that they needed that, so they added that. Another balance weight here, so you can see that. And uh, you can see that there's a, actually a, a, uh, an anti, no, actually a servo tab. That's a servo tab, so that actually helps lighten the controls and it's geared to the deal there. So as the air comes across the deal, as it comes down, uh, or actually if it goes up, this actually helps push the trailing edge up, which lightens up the control. Uh, of course, there's the landing light. The pitot tube also disconnects right here when you fold the wings back to, uh, I think, lay back down that way anyway. So obviously if the wing folded back, this would hit the ground. So that actually pins up over to this little thing right here. So really, really cool. Um, it's all fabric, you know, just basically a steel tube fuselage. The wings are made out of wood. Uh, with wire bracing and uh, you know tubes for push rods and there's some cables and stuff as well um, Tail wheel is a full swivel. It does not lock and uh, Of course you can see that the uh, the trim for the stabilizer actually goes up and down So it, it actually rotates on the rear spar and uh, that goes up in that slot up and down You know to be able to fly it low because this airplane flies not only at low angles attack like a normal airplane But it flies at very high angles of attack and so you need to be able to have that stabilizer Adjustment to be able to trim it very big elevator. It's balanced as well and you can I mean you can see that it's Pretty light there. Checking for cotter pins here and here. The rudder's light. It's also balanced with a horn balance. And what that does is that actually uh, that actually helps uh, the the rudder pressures when you're when you're using it. And what'll happen is since the uh, the it's hinged right here, what happens is when the rudder gets kicked over this way. This obviously creates pressure, but since this is forward of the hinge line, it actually uh, helps and it continues uh, the use as a rudder to deflect the tail to the left, if uh, right rudder's in like this, but it also acts as a counterbalance which lightens the controls. And this is the reason why pterodactyls had that, uh, that big thing behind their neck. They were reptilian you know, flyers and nature had figured out that they could actually build a lighter bird uh, if they put that in the back there so it didn't need a lot of strong ne neck muscles to overcome this aspect and by adding that at least in the case of the the bird you know the the beak was in the front and then they added the counterbalance basically hinged on the bird's head to uh, you know lighten the controls for nature so it didn't get a stiff neck anyway so this all looks good here it's got a little fixed trim tab if you need it. it looks pretty neutral to me. In fact, I'm wondering if, why that's even on there because it's got a stabilizer. There must be another reason for that that I'm unaware of. Got a little uh, place here for... I don't know what goes in there. Probably a band-aid or a bottle of schnapps. Uh, of course, the inspection things are, you know, zippers. So look in the back. Uh, the, the German airplanes um, are very easily uh, understood that they're German. They actually built these uh, in the occupation of France during World War II. And there was a factory north of Paris in Rouen that uh, the Germans forced the French to build the airplanes. Um, and of course, when the, when the Germans got pushed out uh, towards the end of the war, the French found themselves with the knowledge, the tooling, and a lot of spare parts to actually build Fiesler's torches. It was such a great airplane that the French Air Force built Fiesler's torches after the war. And when they eventually ran out of the German Argus engines, they actually came up with one that used a French radial. This particular airplane happens to be an original German airplane, um, although most of the ones out there flying are French, but the easiest way to tell is the fact that German airplanes are all going to have a machine gun in the back because they were wartime airplanes. The French ones, it was just basically covered over there. Uh, it's got a, uh, a seat here 
in the back, which actually the, the observer can sit in. And of course you can see the, the windows are basically kind of on the side because it was an observation airplane. This is actually where you would put the different colored flares if you're uh, flying around for different purposes. Anyway, so you'd sit there, but if there was uh, an enemy territory or there was some potential, uh, you know, uh, you know, airplanes coming after them, you would undo your seat belt. This folds forward, and then you would actually just sit back this way. So you'd sit here like this. I don't think you'd use the seat belt. Uh, this basically, um, I think we wired that so nobody would steal the gun. Anyway, this is, uh, all the parts are real except the, re the receiver. Uh, in the United States, ATF takes a dim view these days on having real machine guns in airplanes. So this was actually all made from scratch and it meets, uh, you know, the fact that it's a non-gun. Uh, got the ammo cans, of course there's one on there. This would collect the deals and you would basically now you can rotate this around like this and of course you can swivel the gun so that's how the gunner would uh, defend himself and hopefully he was on his own to not shoot his tail off okay so we'll put that back there um, trying to think what else this is a place for an external battery to start. We'll go ahead and drain a little bit of fuel out of here. Hadn't flown it in a while. You can tell by the dark blue dot there that I've not drained any fuel out of there in a while. In fact, the airplane just came out of annual, so I need to do a test flight. It smells like fuel. It's not water. And of course, you can also see the, the lacing was another way that they would inspect the uh, airplane as well so you can see how it would uh, allow you to get into see into the fabric belly pretty cool of course here's the pitot lines going out to the, the pitot tube the static and the pressure lines going out there okay so we pulled it through checked the fuel done the sumps that's how we get in. One of the things we noticed was uh, we try and step here as close as we can to the strut. If you do it out here, we've already had to weld that once. It just puts too much leverage on the deal there, you know. So we try and get in and there. More on the end. Of course, I got shoulder harnesses here. There's a flare gun right there. And of course, as I mentioned, all the, the uh, flares would be over here. Seat is. We don't wear a parachute in this airplane. I don't fly any higher than I'm willing to fall. Okay, so seat belt back here. I'm pretty sure I flew this airplane last. I did because anybody else that flies it is bigger than me. Let's just leave it at that. And again, you can see the, the fuel level there, so it's about a half. There's a little more fuel on the other side. There's a little latch right here that clicks for the deal to lock the door, and there's the handle there. Now, hopefully, this thing has got a charged battery. So the first thing that we do, I uh, always tend to zero the altimeter if I'm flying locally. So we'll just zero that there. Uh, first thing we do is we put the fuel on. The fuel on. The pre-flight in this airplane is pretty easy, other than the fact that you want to make sure that the controls are, you know, free and clear before you take off. Uh, it's basically one, two, three. The mags are here. One, two, and both. Okay. And over here, this is up, and this is. There's two different fuel pumps on the engine, and you could isolate them if for some reason one was leaking or something. But you generally run with both. So the pre-flight in this is pretty easy, one, two, three, and make sure that the controls are clear.